Max highlights. Coming up on the show, meaningful music. French pianist Hélène Grimaud interprets works by Bach. Contemporary classics. German choirs sing variations of popular favorites like Rammstein. Playful paper. Bruno Winter has designed an award-winning toy from his favorite material. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Hi there and welcome to our Highlights Edition. And for a real seasonal rush, we'll start off in the Swiss winter sport resort of Davos. That's where the world's best freestyle snowboarders gathered for a major snowboarding competition. And while the athletes are executing their incredible tricks and stunts, specialized photographers are exercising their own reflexes. And getting the best moves for posterity, we caught up with a couple of the pros. Somersaults through the air and skimming backwards and forwards across the obstacle course. This is slope-style snowboarding. The athletes move so quickly they're hardly more than a blur. The coolest moves are easiest to appreciate on film. Martin Nink and Hansi Herbig from Munich specialize in snowboard photography. The German duo are two of the best snowboard photographers in the world. This is their 16th time at the Evolution competition in Davos, Switzerland. We try to stick with one backpack and keep it somewhere between 12 and 15 kilos. The backpack holds one or two cameras, extra lenses, the classic wide-angle lens, a fisheye that lets you get up really close to the action and create some very dramatic perspectives and angles in your shots. These mobile flash units have meanwhile become standard equipment in snowboard photography. They're about as big as a car battery. And we can just carry them onto the slope. The two photographers work for snowboard magazines all around the world. The organizers of the five-day snowboard competition in Davos hired the pair to document the entire event. It should look like it's happening high up in the air. The action should be stylish, with a good hand grip on the board. And we try to get some background, some atmosphere in the shot. Most snowboard photographers were active sportsmen before they specialized in shooting pictures. From experience, they know all the tricks and the best time to open the shutter. On a day like today, I take 500 or more photos, and I'd say about one-third of them are usable. Right away, the hundreds of pictures taken by the two photographers are sorted and edited on the computer. Then they're offered to various newspapers for publication. Everything has to be just perfect. Here you can see that the background is quite green-gray. This means there's no snow on the trees. Ideally, it would have just snowed and the trees would have been white. That would have made the background quieter and the snowboarder would show up much better. In this case, we're lucky that he at least had on a very bright colored jacket. That's important. The snowboarder should be wearing orange, red or neon green jackets. Gray or black are really bad. At Davos, part of the action takes place after dark. This poses a real challenge for the photographers to get good night shots on the quarter pipe. Photography offers an amazing number of possibilities, and you should take advantage of them. You shouldn't confine yourself to anything. Daredevil maneuvers done at breakneck speeds from unusual perspectives. These are the highlights of Evolution 2009 in Davos. Caught on film forever. 
Well, it's right up there with Herbie the Love Bug in terms of cuteness, and it even won the Monte Carlo Rally four years running from 1964 to 67, the world-famous Austin Mini. One of the first compact cars, the Mini was a creation of the British Motor Corporation back in 1959. Nowadays, it's made by BMW, but that has had little to no effect on its cult status. And as the mighty Mini turns 50, we found it ripping up the roads at a classic rally in Enstal, Austria. He won the legendary Monte Carlo Rally over 40 years ago in this car. And now, marking 50 years of the Mini, Rauno Altonen is back behind the wheel at the Planai Classic, where he's as determined as ever to win. He hasn't lost his touch and pushes the car to its limit. It's a very sporty car, so you have to accept the slight discomforts. When Rauno Altonen won the Monte Carlo Rally in 1967, he left the rest of the drivers trailing. Even though at just 100 horsepower, his engine was much smaller than that of his rivals. The Mini sometimes had a mind of its own, but at other times it was incredibly responsive. You could do things with the car you couldn't do with any other car, such as change direction. In the blink of an eye, that gave us the distinct advantage that allowed us to push the limit. People said we always went too fast. That's because people are naturally pessimistic. Since day one, the Mini has remained the rascal of the road. It was the first small car of its kind. Designer Alec Izagoni wanted to cram as much car as possible into the tiniest space. To do that, he mounted the engine sideways. If the motor was positioned the conventional way, from here to there, there'd be a fan here, and the cooler, and the grill. It'd make it 80 centimeters to one meter longer. Unlike many other famous British brands, the Mini has always transcended class. Over the years, its popularity soared across all sections of society. Aristocrats loved it, and so did hippies. It's a cult car, a favorite with show-offs and more humble folk. Today, it's still popular with free spirits who appreciate its iconic status. It's a car you can really feel, a car that allows you to get a sense of the road and its bends. You're really behind the wheel experiencing it all. Modern cars tend to be much more wimpish and so are we. But that's not to say the Mini hasn't changed with the times. In 2000, a new model was launched that put an end to its rough and ready image. But local buyers didn't seem to mind that the new BMW Mini was technically unrelated to the original. The Planai Classic is a bit like a party celebrating 50 years of the Mini. It's so much fun that Rauno Altonen doesn't even mind not finishing first. I think the Minis enjoyed everything that life has to offer. Respect, love, it's a car that has enormous sentimental value to so many people. I don't think that any other car has ever been loved as much as the Mini. Mini, a small car, but a big name.
Another big name, in the music business at least, is Rammstein, an industrial metal band from Berlin that is the most successful German language music group in the world. And even if their music is most noteworthy for its morbid lyrics and controversial themes, their fan base is steadily growing, especially as choirs around Germany discover the melodic possibilities of their tunes. Here's more. Engel, or Angel, a song by the internationally successful German heavy metal band Rammstein, known for their idiosyncratic style of music. And the same text in a choral version, sung by the jazz chorus Voices in Time at the Southern German Festival Jazz Vocal Zoot 2009. With this choral version of Angel, Voices in Time won in the jazz category of the 2006 German Choral Competition. There, the song has become the must-do piece for jazz. The challenge you set for yourself is to maintain the groove of the original, even if it doesn't translate one to one, but has to be broken down into the sound and rhythmic possibilities of a chorus. The choral version was published by Gustav Bosse Publishing House in Kassel, a member of the Bärenreiter Group. Sheet music has been printed here since 1923. There are more than 3,500 orchestral scores in stock. With the choral version of Angel, the music publisher has started a new series aimed at youth choirs. When you work with a piece the public already recognizes, it has the effect of making people say, aha. It's a piece they already know, but perhaps would have never associated with a choir. Rammstein as choral music. The choir members think the two fit together perfectly. Where the voice comes from all at once, who interprets what, I find the structure of the piece really exciting. I really like it, and it's a real crowd pleaser. Held in a former Benedictine monastery, Jazz Vocal Zoot brings together choirs from across Germany. Festivals like this help bring choral music to a younger audience. The trend is towards smaller vocal groups singing modern arrangements. Here, well-known choir directors like Jens Johansen from Denmark conduct workshops. We have put up some, some lighthouses to follow. I mean, it's, it's uh, so important that someone takes the lead, that some, some choirs show, some vocal groups show that, that this and that can be done. And it's interesting to listen to, not only to sing. In spite of the success of the choral version of Engel, Voices in Time aren't currently planning any joint performances with Rammstein. I could imagine doing it, but I don't think the audience that attends Rammstein concerts would be prepared for us. But you never know. Rammstein fans might just find themselves spontaneously singing along to the heavenly sounds of Voices in Time's Engel. Well, on her latest CD, French pianist Hélène Grimaud has stuck to a more classical source of inspiration. One of Europe's most extravagant musicians, she has attracted great attention with her conservationist's passion for wolves and her introverted yet dramatic style. Well, daring a departure from the romantic works that sealed her reputation, she focuses this time on selections from Johann Sebastian Bach. And she told us what motivated her to do so. Hélène Grimaud is not only one of the best pianists in the world, but also one of the most fascinating. The 
French virtuoso is determined to get at the heart of the music she loves. Hélène Grimaud was a firm believer that there is something profound below the surface of music. Works by German composers are among her favorites. She sees her instrument as a means of exploring the music's hidden secrets. I think it's true that for every musician, an instrument is a way to rise to new heights. There's a certain solitude and isolation connected with working in this profession. But it also has its wonderful sides. The piano is an instrument that's full of contradictions. I have a very strong connection to German Romanticism, the writers and poets and philosophers, and of course the musicians. It's thanks to the composers that I've stayed faithful to my instrument, curiously, the way the composers wrote and expressed their feelings through the piano. Bach's universal world of sound is at the heart of Hélène Grimaud's new album. She decided to record works by Bach together with adaptations penned by later composers. This music has something sacred about it, a perfection and beauty that's almost not of this world, but at the same time it's profoundly human. Her album provides an emphatic illustration that Bach's music is not primarily about the instrument. The message goes far beyond that. I'm still not sure whether it's at all possible, but the idea was to find out why this music is able to touch everybody so deeply and speak to them with such force. They say Bach's music is like the Bible, and Bach is the father of all musicians, the source of inspiration. In a way, the works comprising the cycle of the well-tempered clavier are like holy scripture to a pianist. Germany is among the countries Hélène Grimaud will be touring in 2009. Well, it might be too late for this past Christmas, but it looks like this gift idea will be around for a while. Paper stars are like a cross between Lego building blocks and origami, in which brightly colored pre-cut forms kids aged about six and over can build three-dimensional figures. They were invented by German designer Bruno Winter, who's already picked up a couple of design prizes for his environmentally friendly fun, and we met up with him in Kassel for a demonstration. Ducks, mice, and deer. These are just a few of the colorful creations that can be fashioned with paper star. This new construction toy and craft idea made out of paper is for the young and the young at heart. Paper star is the brainchild of Bruno Winter, a young designer who lives in Kassel. The idea came to me when I was remembering that I'd once done origami as a child and gone a bit beyond the rules. I used scissors, glue and toothpicks. I made a little ship and I was really proud of it. I had the nice feeling of having designed something all by myself. Twenty years later, Vinto returned to his childhood pastime of working with paper while completing a degree in design. Paper Star was born. It 
Its four star-shaped elements are made of brightly coloured, recycled paper. The star's points connect with one another and the paper's flexibility allows a myriad of shapes to be created. Paper star is three activities in one. It's part handicraft, part origami, the 2,000 euro Japanese art of paper folding, and part construction toy. For me, paper is the number one material for design. It's also the one you encounter in your youngest years. When you're drawing and painting and doing crafts, it's very flexible and it reacts to any change. Paper Star was awarded the International Forum Product Design Award 2008. The jury of experts lauded its unique way of sparking the imagination. Castle-based publisher Rotopole Press sells Paper Stars for around 22 euros a set. If the product proves popular with customers, Bruno Winter plans to recreate them in extra-large versions. And don't forget, if you'd like to see any part of this program, again, you can find it at YouTube forward slash Deutsche Welle English. But that's all for this time, and we hope you join us again soon. Until then, take good care, and bye-bye.